Okay, thanks for coming. Nothing of what I say represents the views of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis or the Federal Reserve System. Uh, second disclaimer, there's gonna be money demand. Third disclaimer, is not gonna be rational expectations. So, so you stay at your own risk. <laughs> it's like in the plane. This is time to leave, otherwise. Okay, so this is actually, why I'm gonna be focusing on a risk of leaving the euro. It's gonna be narrow. Uh, these are some prominent people uh, suggesting, uh, well, they got many more votes than I ever got ever uh, in elections. That's what I meant by prominent. Uh, we're basically talking about getting back the central bank and its ability to print. There is a, something called modern monetary theory that is a little bit uh, fashionable in the US today, which somehow relates to this notion of how can you use that, the printing machine. Of course, you're going to get inflation. I'm not going to surprise any of you on that. Uh, <coughs> what ask, what's going to be new here is how much inflation. So we'll study the consequences of leaving the euro for any of these countries, and then the effect is going to be really narrow. It's just what inflation you're going to get afterwards. The most going to be simple and standard, going to be simple on purpose, is just to generate a money demand. Results go with a much more general money demand, but this gives us a linear money demand that's going to be useful for, for, for explaining the how the model works. The main innovation is that it's just not gonna have rational expectations. Now, uh, I will talk a lot about this. If, he, if, if I were gonna do the model with rational expectations, I would need only seven minutes. So the other 53 is going to try to justify that this is a, a useful exercise. And what I mean by useful exercise, I really want to think this as a policy question. I really want to think of what a simple monetary model tells us of what inflation would be if some of these countries actually choose to leave the euro, which I'm going to define precisely within the model what that means. Uh, now, I want to emphasize that our agents in our model are not going to be irrational in the sense that they will have a probability distribution of the variables they care about, and they're going to maximize utility using that probability distribution. That probability distribution, in general, is not going to be the equilibrium distribution of that particular variable, which is going to be the price level next period. Um, but it's going to be very close, in a sense we're going to make precise. So, of course, that leaves us with degrees of freedom, because uh, now we have to, I have to tell you what we are going to assume about that probability distribution. Now we'll go in gory detail on how we do that. And, uh, and essentially, what we're going to impose as a, as a discipline in device, which of course is not going to give you a unique probability distribution. It's going to give you one that satisfies a requirement that we believe is a good requirement, which is that if we run this economy in equilibrium with these agents that have a probability distribution, which is not the exact distribution, they cannot reject the distribution they use for reasonably large samples, like 10 years, 15, 20 years. So instead of using the exact fixed point, we're going to use the distribution, which of course is going to affect the equilibrium. But that distribution is going to differ that much, and I will have to be very specific of what I mean by that much from the true distribution of the variable. But there's going to be lots of distributions. Yes. That yes. So there's going to be huge multiplicity of equilibrium. Uh, given the, no, there's going to be multiplicity given once we assume something about the distribution, right. Right. there's going to be a unique, but we can make assumptions that differ a little bit. And actually, the way I'm going to do it, I'm going to choose the probability distribution. At the end of the day, I'm going to have one free parameter only. And that if I set that free parameter to zero, I get exactly rational expectations. And then I'm going to tell you what happens if I get that parameter to be slightly different from zero. And that parameter will have an economic interpretation in terms of a signaling extraction problem the agents are going to be making optimally in equilibrium. But yes, I mean, this is the notion that you can get into the wilderness of irrationality, as Tom Sargent liked to put it a couple of decades ago, and remain clean is not a notion we believe in. We're going to get dirty. And eventually, we'll try to convince you that our dirt is not that bad. Particularly if you're really thinking about the policy problem. 
particularly if you're thinking and telling what do you actually believe things uh, are going to be if you leave the euro, then I think considering this robustness, it's very useful. Uh, and of course, because it's not going to be very robust to these small deviations. The fact that we make some small deviations in a, and small, I'll try to be as precise as I can to define what I mean, uh, it's going to change the outcome quite a bit. Yes? It's not a self-confirming equilibrium. So it's not like in equilibrium, it holds and it's No, it's not going to be exactly that. It's, some, it's statistically going to be some sort of that. Agents will not be able to reject the model after 15 years. No. No, they, they, well, I mean, an advantage of this relative to other things you might have seen, this is simple. So if you don't understand what we did, it's certainly my fault, because it's not complicated. So what it is exactly, we'll eventually can talk afterwards. So what do we do with the paper? So the first thing is, again, this is in quotes, because I'll, I'll, I'll be more precise. If you have small departures from rational expectation, this is going to severely amplify the inflation rate you can get in equilibrium. So the notion that if you print money, you get inflation is going to come out of any model with rational expectations. Once we make this with these departures, you can get much wilder inflation rates. And we think that, as I said, we're not going to be completely clean. We'll get a little bit dirty because we get into the wilderness. But uh, I guess that if you take a shower afterwards, you're okay. So let me be specific of what we are going to mean leaving the euro. At the end of the day, there's going to be a model, and the model is going to, some things are going to happen. And then I'm going to define that. It's going to happen if you leave the euro. And there's going to be a bunch of assumptions, and you can argue about them. And if, if those assumptions are not satisfied, things can be different. But we believe this is somehow, these assumptions somehow, uh, reflect the views of people that are claiming that they, they would like to leave the euro and some facts that we have seen in the, lay, in the, few, in the, in the last year. So the first thing is that we're going to impose these countries do not do immediate austerity. They're going to fiscal surpluses immediately after leaving the euro. They could. If they do, they would not get any inflation. But if you're going to take austerity, what's the point of leaving? That's the way we're thinking about it. So we're not going to have immediate austerity. In the long run, you'll make an adjustment but it's going to take a while. Of course, you regain discretion of a monetary policy. That's not very uh, controversial. And the other thing we're going to claim that being within the euro allows these countries to still uh, sell sovereign bonds at reasonable rates. Uh, these are very highly indebted countries. And some of these countries, uh, not France, but, uh, but the other, but, but certainly Italy and, and Spain and Portugal, they have very high increases in the express, as we saw in the previous paper. And uh, there's some reason to believe that the ECB stopped those spreads from going completely wide. If there's no ECB behind to make those policies, it's sensible to believe that these countries are going to have, that, uh, the debt is very high, are going to have some troubles issuing sovereign bonds. So it means that they will have to resort to financing the deficit with seniors. So if they don't, things are going to be different. But we believe this is a good description of what would happen in these countries if, if they actually leave the euro. So, it's also you could apply this to banning the peg, any peg, like, yeah. like Argentina yeah. in Absolutely. And actually, the model we're going to use is the model that we used with Albert uh, several years ago to match the hyperinflation episodes in the 80s in Latin America. So, so that there's nothing really specific about the euro. It's leaving a peg. Uh, but the only specific thing is that is, is this issue. That we're all, it's not, you're not only leaving a peg, you're also leaving some ability to borrow that we're going to claim you're going to lose after you leave, which is more controversial than the others, but, uh, but that, that's an additional feature. It's not just leaving the peg. OK. So as I said, part of, part of my job is to try to argue that in the model, the agents are not irrational or just have some sort of incomplete information. The way I'm going to do it, I'm, I'm going to have an OG model really very similar to the one that Gaetano did, so that's going to save me some time, and us, or to all of us. Uh, and I'm going to start with heterogeneous agents, uh, 
Because I, I just want to remind you that when we go to the representative agent and we solve for rational expectations, we may make a bunch of assumptions that, uh, that I'm going to claim they are a little bit extreme, uh, and that then if you don't satisfy all those assumptions, agents cannot learn the equilibrium pricing function. And then if they cannot learn, they will have to have some other beliefs, and that's where we get these additional degrees of freedom so I'm going to be, I'm going to be talking about. Now, for the model I'm going to show you, heterogeneity on itself is not going to be very important. I'm just going to use the heterogeneity to just remind you, now that is the time to take a nap, so to wake you up a little bit, all the assumptions we actually make when we compute our rational expectations in equilibrium. But the subjective beliefs are going to be shared across all the agents. No, ye yes, because when I do that, I'm just going to vanish heterogeneity. Because what is important for the mechanism is not the heterogeneity itself, it's just that I have these other beliefs that are different from rational expectation. So my heterogeneity is, heterogeneity is going to show up for like a few slides, uh, just to remind you how many assumptions we make. And then I'll just say, OK, but that, then I'll, that will be my first justification for having this exploration into the wilderness. Uh, but then I will just go back to the representative agent, which are the only ones I can handle. OK, and then I will do positive analysis, and I will do normative analysis. I will be computing welfare gains of doing different things. Once I already got into the wilderness, I want to go full Monty. And then I'm going to show you, the, 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 if, if time allows, which I still, I'm not sure, I'll, I'm going to show you how the test works and how they perform in equilibrium. So let me start the constant cohort size two-period OG model, that's uh, Gaetano's world. Uh, and now many is going to be one in the first period, and then it's going to be some number in the second period that from the point of view of the agent is not, uh, it's not unknown, so you're born, and then you're born with one. Everybody's alike in the first, in the, in the first endowment in the first period, but you can have some endowment in the second period that you know when you're born. But it's going to be different across all of us. And then I'm going to have some expected utility. The whole point is which probability distribution I put in here. That's the whole game. Now, when you are born, you also know your preference for today against tomorrow. So, and there's no uncertainty at the individual level on either the endowment on the second period or how much you like consumption today versus consumption tomorrow. But there is some heterogeneity some on, on this E and on the alpha. Now, the only assets agents can hold is money. So this is, this is where I'm departing a little bit from him. There is no other savings technology. It's just money. Or that's, that's the only thing there is. So in the first period, you're going to consume. You're going to demand some money uh, in the first period. And then you, you're constrained by your endowment. And in the second period, you're going to eat your endowment plus how much money you brought from before. So we're going to make the second period endowment to be lower than one. So there's going to be an incentive to save, and then there's going to be money in equilibrium. But what, 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 just when you're stressing the differences, huge difference you have is you have endowment in the second period. If Caetano had had endowment in the second period, a lot of his results would have changed. I don't think so, but let's leave that for, the, for afterwards. Fine. It's a small one. Who cares, who cares if it's small? If, 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 as long as it's... Uh, because with, the, with the, the combination of an endowment in the second period and the, the uh, 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 storage technology, you could have gotten more equilibrium than he just had. I disagree. But this is his I paper, that, but, anyway. but not now. No. And I don't think you will try to show me, but you will not be able okay. to. But not now. I but, I, but we're going to let everybody know once we get to Minneapolis that I was right. That was a provocation. Nope. Just in case you didn't think. Okay. Good. So <laughs> there you go. So okay. So then you just replace the budget constraints in the in the preferences, and of course the only choice is M, and the only source of uncertainty is PT plus one for the agent. Okay. So that's uh, uh, that, that's the model. Get first order conditions with respect to. To M, this is log utility, so you get uh, this expression there, where there are two agent-specific parameters, which are the preferences and the endowment in the second period. 
which of course defines implicitly an individual money demand for this particular agent. Now, this is nonlinear, so in order to make progress, we linearize the stuff, and then we get a linear money demand function. The OG structure, the endowment in the second period, all the things are designed to give us this linear, this linear demand function. Where these two parameters here, which then I will have to calibrate, are functions, these are agent specific now, and they're functions of the two agent specific characteristics. So I can say that an agent is defined by E and alpha, or by phi, phi, phi and gamma, okay? Yep? That just gives me linear, and then I'll be able to show you some. Uh, well, that's actually true. Good point. Yeah. Uh, oh, then what, how, how do you compute an equilibrium? You aggregate for the money demand. In equilibrium, you make it equal to the money supply. With a representative agent, this becomes just this equation. You just iterate on this equation and find a solution. Now, if you, with a heterogeneous agent, the computation of this for each particular agent is a much more involved thing. Right? First, you need to require that every agent figures out the expectations <laughs> of the other agents, which is forecasting the forecast of others. Need to know the covariance between these two agent-specific parameters in order to compute this. So you need to know the first and second moments of the distribution of these features over the population, and that's because I, li I log linearized. If I had not log linearized, you needed to know much more about the distribution. So you need to know a lot. I don't even know this for my family. You need to know this for your whole country in order to figure it out. So, uh, and what we're going to do, we're just going to leave the euro, which is a really drastic policy change. So we're claiming learning this pricing function is complicated. And then what we want to do is robustness of policy analysis to cases in which you're gonna, you might know a lot about the economy, otherwise your distribution is not going to be very similar to the rational expectation, to the, to the true distribution. But you don't know exactly everything in order to compute this pricing function. Okay? So now we'll go to the representative agent model. Uh, and when leaving the euro, I'm going to allow, because I wanted to explore some things about, about policy, uh, we're going to allow for making a deal with, this, let's say, the IMF, and allow for the possibility that from time to time you might get some short-term financial assistance. Okay? I'm going to leave that as a possibility. And I want to study what, what implications of these would be. So the first I'm going to describe the model in which there is no financial assistance, because I still never, never told you anything about the, about, the, about the money supply. I just told you how you, com how you compute the money demand. But the way this is going to work then, then we, for the, for, we're, we're going to get the money demand that comes from here. I'm just putting put the wiggle here for you not to believe this is the conditional expectation. This is going to be the beliefs that I'm going to be talking about. And then there is DT is going to be sort of like the senior edge the government will have to raise. Uh, and then that has to be financed with printing money. Okay, so this is uh, just a model in which uh, you have a money demand that comes from the structure of the model. Again, the linearity here is not really important for the, for the results. Uh, we just need a money demand that is, depends on the, on, the, on the expected inflation. Uh, and then we have a budget constraint for the government here. Okay, so this is, this is going to be like part of the deficit that will need to be monetized. So what is this D going to be? Uh, we're going to assume that there is, forget about this for a moment, so there is some persistence here. There's a lot of persistence in the data. And this is going to be really important. Persistence is going to be a huge, a huge difference uh, in here. And I'll try to convey why that, that's important. Uh, and then this delta here is like the long run value for the deficit. And what we're going to assume is that this delta, will, it has some like permanent and some transitory shocks. And this is going to be what the agents will not know at the end of the day. We'll not really know what, how to, when they see changes in the deficit, they cannot really tell whether it's a permanent or a transitory one. That's the source of the, of the confusion that is going to be when they try to forecast inflation in the model. Okay, so now this, but this is going to be exogenous. These are all, this is all exogenous. So given the evolution of this D, these two equations solve for money and prices. 
Okay? Can we think of zero as a period in which they leave the euro? Yes. With some process for this. Okay, now, at the end of the day, what the way I'm going to be claiming that uh, what, the, what, the, what the model suggests is that you might have bursts of inflation which are really huge, hyperinflation. So see, that's what we're, we're going to claim. The risk of hyperinflation is far from zero if you do this. Now, countries that went through that, they sometimes use exchange rate rules to stabilize the economy. And the way one can think of these exchange rate rules working in a model like this would be that this is an open economy, so when you, for simplicity, I'm going to make the real exchange rate to be equal to one. That's not particularly important. But then if you put law of one price in the, in the traded goods by controlling, and this is the foreign price, by controlling the nominal interest rate, you control inflation. <laughs> okay, so this is like the, the purpose of, of fixing the, or, 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 or having a crawling peg on the nominal exchange rate is to control inflation. But then if you control the M with that, this equation will give you M. But then who knows whether this budget constraint is going to be satisfied now. So if you're going to impose these exchange rate rules, you might need, and in general, you will need some financial assistance to finance the deficit while you impose the rule. OK? So a part of the policy is going to be, I call the IMF, and I put an exchange rate rule from time to time in the model. I'm going to allow for that possibility. OK? And you don't contemplate changes in the... Uh, yeah. Yes. And we know what happens. If you just eliminate the deficit, you eliminate everything. So if you do austerity, then none of this really matters. We kind of see these statements about leaving the euro as ways to avoid the European imposed austerity. But, but you don't have to. Think of like, I want to have like some austerity at the beginning so to affect expectations. <coughs> you could do that. Yep. You could certainly do that. And this is natural, it's going to happen because the deficit is very persistent. So if you had a, a bunch of good shocks, mm -hmm. boom, you actually, you, you can get surpluses here with positive probability. And that's going to be affecting expectations. So, and I'll show you simulations for long periods of, of that. So that could certainly happen. So the deficit thing is how you get determinacy? How you rule out that the money has no value? No, I'm getting exactly to that right now. I'm going there, I'm going there. No, here with, with learning there is not going to be that indeterminacy. With rational expectation, there is going to be. So what do you do? I'm going to describe in three slides the rational expectations model, which is going basically, uh, that will save, me, save us a lot of time. Well, maybe I will use it for something else. But maybe I should, I should find, finish five, year, five minutes earlier because of Gaetano's contribution. Uh, but essentially, uh, you can, Replace now. Forget about the, the for the moment. I'm going to do the rational expectations without the IMF. So then you just replace M in the equation here. And then you solve for D. And then you get a, a mapping from a, a difference equation in inflation rates that depends on the deficit. Okay. So this is what happens in rational expectations if you do the way you did it in your first year macro course. And this equation is going to govern the dynamics of inflation and the rational expectation. Looks like a Laffer curve, but not the, the typical Laffer curve you used to see is like the steady state one, in which you have a curve that goes up and then comes down, and then you have a straight line that gives you the two stationary points. That is not really what we're doing, because in that curve what you're assuming is inflation is constant, the deficit is constant, and it's giving you the two values of stationary inflation that satisfies the budget. Here I'm giving you <clears throat> all the possible solutions that satisfy the budget. Of course, the two stationary points will have to be the same. But if you plot this equation, you get something like this. And this is Sargent Wallace in the, of, the, of, of the 80s. So here you have inflation in T plus 1, in T minus 1, here inflation in T. And this curve is that function that I just draw. Uh, of course, this function depends on D. As D moves, this is going to be moving. But if you think for a moment in terms of a fixed D, then what you essentially have is two stationary points, which are the good point in the Laffer curve, 
the bad point in the Laffer curve. For Gaetano, this was actually going, money was going to zero. Here you cannot go to zero because you have to finance the deficit. So you go to a finite point in which you're financing the deficit. But short of that, what you get is one station, one, one equilibrium here, and a continuum of other equilibria that all converge to this one. So this is what... It is true, but this is not converged. They're moving over time uh, because these are all equilibria. Uh, so you have one, if you fix the deficit, you have one equilibrium here in which inflation is constant, another one here where inflation is constant but higher, and a bunch of, of equilibria that start somewhere between these two, and over time, they go to that one. Is that better, Ramon? Yeah. Okay. This is what I'm going to be calling speculative hyperinflation. Because you could have this equilibria financing the same amount of deficit, and then you end up financing the deficit with larger inflation rates, the same, the same deficit. Now, all but one equilibria, shit, I wrote this before checking with you, uh, converge to the wrong side of the Laffer curve. Uh, and this is actually remarkable. I never quoted this paper myself, and I never saw it quoted in a seminar before until <laughs> yesterday. So it's like two times in the same conference that I gave brutal increase in this. This was part of my of my of my thesis. But essentially, the claim here. No, the other one. I know. I know. I know. Uh, still, one is a lot. Uh, so essentially, the point here is that if you have these convert these exchange rate rules out of equilibrium path. You can rule all this out. Then Gaetano is bringing some new things which I fully didn't, didn't fully digest. So I'm going to leave Gaetano's. I think it's consistent with what, with what I'm saying here, but I'm not completely sure. He not necessarily has to agree with me. But essentially, I'm going to think that if I have these okay, exchange rate rules I can impose, and I can impose them even out of equilibrium path, I rule out all these things. And along the equilibrium path, I don't need exchange rate rules for these. So, uh, no need for, for special funding in equilibrium. So this IMF thing doesn't make any sense if I'm just using rational expectations. And if I believe Oswald Rogoff uh, and me, and myself, I typically believe myself, uh, then you can just focus, and it, that's what I'm going to do on this one. Okay. Okay, here's what I'm going to do now. If you, log linearizations here are tricky because this is gonna move you all over the place. Uh, but essentially what I'm going to do, I'm going to uh, log linearize around that low, equilibri low, low inflation equilibrium. And then essentially what you get is that inflation is an autoregressive process in the rational expectations equilibrium. The persistence parameter is the same as the deficit when you log linearize inflation. And there is, going to, there is a term here which is going to be like the long run inflation rate, which generates the properties of the long run value for the deficit. So it's going to have also a permanent and a temporary component. Equilibrium inflation is a function of the state in rational expectations. Of course, this is, also, this is a function of the deficit. But if you log linearize in forecasting inflation, you can just use inflation itself. That's what we're going to give to our agents. Our agents are going to know this, and this is how they're going to be forecasting inflation. That's, that's, that, that's part of the three parameters that we have. So we're going to assume agents use this equation. Uh, and I'm, we're going to give them knowledge about the persistency of the, of, the, of the deficit. That's easy to estimate. You're basically estimating an exogenous process. The way we calibrate the deficit, that's how we're going to do it. So if, you, if you're learning on those, you learn that fast. It's not going to do much. What it's going to give you a kick is that we're going to assume agents do not know this long-run value for inflation. They have to compute. And again, as the permanent component of the deficit has permanent and transitory shocks, long-run inflation inherits those properties. And then basically, we're going to endow agents with this formulation for beliefs. And we're going to assume they don't know this long-run value, but know these properties. Knowing these properties means that then this term, which is the long-run value of inflation, we're going to assume that agents believe that this is going to be equal to uh, the true value, B, times a transitory shock, but B evolves as a random walk. Okay? So that's where we have a permanent component here and a transitory component there. And the assumption is that neither of these is observable. You just observe this term here. So this gives you a signal extraction problem. 
So if we let beta to be the best forecast for Bt at a given point in time, and beta t minus 1 the prior entering that period, then the prior is optimally updated as follows. This is just the solution of the Kalman filter. In which you update as a function of the past mistakes, where this coefficient here depends on the volatilities of the permanent and the transitory shock. So for instance, notice that if the transitory shock, sorry, if the permanent shock were always zero, these are going to be uh, mean zero shocks. If the volatility of eta would be zero, then the V is just going to be equal to a number plus an IID shock. Essentially means that then there's nothing to learn from, from V except for, the, for just keeping your sample mean. Uh, essentially means that then if the, if the sigma, uh, if the, if the Sigma eta, then is zero, this goes to infinity, which means that this goes to zero, you just do not update anything. There's nothing to learn if there are no permanent shocks. So if the permanent shock has some volatility, but it's not too big, alpha is going to be large, one over alpha is going to be small. And again, this is optimally updating these priors, given that we assume that those are the beliefs. So if we center the prior at the low inflation equilibrium in rational expectations, and we make the volatility of eta to be arbitrarily small if we just remove the permanent component so there is no more any signal extraction problem so agents know everything they need to know. Essentially, we have the rational expectations as a special case. Okay, so we're basically selecting that particular equilibrium that you get under rational expectations. So the reason why here we get agents that are not completely certain about the rational expectation solution is because there is the possibility of some permanent shocks on the long-run inflation rate, they are updating the, the, their, their beliefs according to those shocks. And then you might have beliefs that are uh, uh, distributions that are not exactly the true distributions in the model. If you just kill in the model the permanent shocks to, to the deficit. So we're always going to set the initial prior to the rational expectation. So if when I give you solutions for the model for 1 over alpha equals 0, that is the rational expectation solution. And then I'm going to show you, you, try, you could try to discipline this alpha using these sigmas. We get alphas that are, one of our alphas that are much larger than the ones I'm going to show you now. I'm going to show you alphas that go from 0 to 0 0.05, which means that you give 95% to your prior and 5% to, to, the, to the observations you have just seen. OK. Now, this is a little more complicated because now the expectations depend on past inflation and on the past expectations. So now when I plug in, I get a, a, a solution that involves inflation today and inflation yesterday, like with the rational expectations, but I also get the beta t minus 1 and the beta t. So this is not a two-variable two equation, that I, so I cannot plot it. But if I start with something relatively, like with shocks, like really small, close to the steady state in which this converts to inflation and expectations are the same, then you get a relationship between inflation today and expected inflation today that I can plot. So when I plot that, I get an equation that goes in a different way. So with rational expectation, this curve goes like this. With this learning, it goes the other way around. That's going to be all of it. So I'm going to spend, and this is from the paper, this is what we did with Albert many years ago. So we are exploiting this. So this rest point, when expectations are equal to inflation, because I assume that they are also equal to past inflation and to past expectations, they are exactly the same solution than the rational expectations. But this is where expectations are equal to inflation. This point here is also the same the same rest point. But what learning is doing is changing the dynamics of the, of the system. And it's changing the dynamics of the system in a particular way. So let me tell you what is in this plot. Here I have beta t. Beta t is expectations today. And this is inflation, uh, how expectations affect inflation. But again, when I'm close to here, I'm close to a stationary solution in which inflation yesterday was also equal to inflation today. And what, the, 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 what this shape is showing you is that if you have a shock that moves you a little bit away from here, then you come back. <coughs> because this is expectation, this is inflation, but then inflation is going to affect expectations tomorrow. So now this becomes a stable solution. So our interpretation is that once you leave the euro, you start 
finance in the deficit, you essentially start, let's say you start here because the priors are going to be the rational expectations equilibrium. And then there are going to be shocks to the deficit that are going to be moving this up and down. So you're basically going to be bouncing around here. Now, eventually there is another point here. And of course, at this point, the dynamics are the other way around. If you start below, you come here. If you start above, you go up. If the shocks are not very volatile, this thing is not going to boom much. Unless they, they can be persistent, because persistent means that you have two or three sequences of bad shocks, and then the deficit is going to go up. When the deficit goes up, this moves like there. When it moves like there, these two rest points get closer to each other. So once you've got a, a sequence of bad shocks, this curve is moving there, and then the probability that now you get into the, to the right of the second stationary point, you go kaboom. So that's basically the dynamics we're going to explore. If you have a bunch of good shocks and the deficit is low, you're, you're living around here, and that's what you would expect with rational expectations, live around here. But a sequence of bad shocks, because of the persistency, you're going to move this up, and then eventually you get some shocks that get you up there. And what, what do you mean, get you up there? Then things just explode. Hey, I have to, hey, that's where the IMF comes. So there are two possibilities here. But so essentially, What's going on is that you have a stable region and an unstable region. And this is for the same process of the deficit. It can be relatively small shocks to the deficit that take you to the other region, and then you go, then you go up. And once you get up here, this is governed by the dynamics between inflation and expectation. The deficit is not playing such a big role. So, 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 so in that explosive part, People think that beta is actually a constant. I mean, B is a constant. Where? So, what are people thinking when they're on that explosive? They don't understand they're on an explosive path. Oh, they do it because they, they expect inflation, and then inflation goes up. They adjust inflations up because of their mistakes. They're basically thinking that there is a permanent shock in inflation now, and then they adjust inflations up because they adjust inflation expectations up. Money demand goes down. To finance the same deficit, you need an even higher inflation, and then you go up. So here, people are just going back, going behind expectations all the time, no, but no, going up. But a, a period T, do they understand a period T plus K, that, this, that things are going to be? In this, in this benchmark? No, they don't. They're just, no, 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 no. Here, they just, they're just surprised. They're, they're taught, here, they're surprised all the time. Yeah, okay. Surprised all the time. So what happens here? Well. Sequence of large shocks bring you to the unstable region, and then eventually money disappears. If money disappears, there's no way to collect seniorage. Then you need, an, the, the only way to go is austerity. You just, the only source of revenue you had is not there. Basically, you have to reduce expending and get the deficit equal to zero. An alternative is you call the IMF, enforces a fixed exchange rate regime. The fixed exchange rate regime is going to bring inflation down because of the crawling peg. Uh, and then inflation is going to go down and expectations will come down again. Now, you may need assistance to finance the deficit while the exchange rate regime is in place. Once you stabilize the economy back, real money balances go up. And that allows you to collect additional senior edge, and then you would eventually accumulate some reserves at the end. So at the beginning, you may lose a few. But in the end, you may win. The question is what the net effect is going to be. And I'm going to make computations to tell you how that works. And of course, you can repeat the cycle of stabilizing, calling the IMF, leave it, letting the IMF go once you're back in the stable region, and then eventually call the IMF back when you're out. And eventually, you have to do austerity if you want to get out of this cycle of high inflation, hyperinflation, IMF, and back. Which again, this is sort of this is a good narrative of some of the hyperinflationary episodes in the in the in the 80s in, in Latin America, and you would, and these were not driven by deficits of 14 percent of GDP. So leaving the IMF is going to turn Spain into Argentina. No, leaving the euro. You leaving the euro. Yes. It, the euro. Absolutely. That's uh, yep. That's what Argentina is saying. We're assuming the deficit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or, 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 or no. The, the deficit process in Spain is much worse than it ever was in uh, in, in Argentina. Argentina. I see. Yep. <laughs> no, it is. 
Now, now team knows the data of the Latin America. Okay, so in the simulation, we're going to what I'm going to show you is what happens to a bank account that a central bank of these countries could open at the IMF and that it's zero at the beginning of the exchange rate rule. And now I'll show you the balance in that account. It's going to go negative in the beginning and then positive in the end. So we estimate the process of the deficit for Greece, Portugal, Italy, and Spain. You get pretty much persistent parameters around 0.9. Uh, now we need to calibrate the parameters of the money demand. For that, we need to know how money demand behaves when inflation is high in these countries. It was never high. So we used data from Argentina to calibrate the Laffer curve. So the maximum of revenue you can get is 5% of GDP, and you do that at an inflation rate which is about 60% per quarter. That's, that how, that's how I'm going to calibrate the two parameters in the money demand. Long run deficit is eventually going to be zero in the simulations, but it's going to take a long while to get, to get there. Persistency is 0.93. Standard deviation is just 1.5. And then the persistency of inflation, we assume it's the same. With learning, actually, they're not exact. In the rational expectation, the persistency of inflation is exactly equal to the persistence of the deficit, close to the, to the, to the steady state. With learning, it's not, but it's very, it's very similar. So we just put it the same. And then we need these two parameters, which are the money demand parameters. And again, we calibrated those to have a Laffer curve that looks like the ones we've seen in countries that went through high inflation. OK. There's one parameter I didn't tell you about. That's 1 over alpha. I'm just going to show you what happens for different values of 1 over alpha, which again is sort of like the, how much you trust your prior that is the rational expectations prior always. So what I'm going to show you is. That's going to be the one dimensional yes. deviation. Yes. Of when 1 over alpha is 0, I'm, I'm selecting the low inflation equilibrium in rational expectations. So that's how you can, and then if you give the interpretation of how much faith you have in your prior, that's, that, that's, that's the one that I'll, be, I'll be playing around with. Are they choosing their best alpha? The best alpha would be the ratio of these standard deviations. And it's actually, if we, if we, did, we did that, we, we estimated this process for, the, for, the, for, for, for inflation, and it gives a 1 over alpha, which is like 0.2. We're going to explore 1 over alpha is much lower than that. So this is what I'm going to show you. Now I'm going to leave the euro. I'm going to have these beliefs. And I'm going to run the model for I don't know how many periods, but the table will say. And I'm going to tell you which is the probability of how, have hyperinflation. What's a hyperinflation when you hit that bound? What I'm going to be doing here is I'm going to assume, uh, OK, I'm going to tell you how, when am I going to do the exchange rate rule. And then I'm going to give you a time series simulation to tell you what is, how, what's the amplification effect. And then I'm going to do some policy. And I don't think I'll have time for the test. OK, so this is the first, the first thing. Here we start with a, with, a, a long, with a long run deficit of 0. That's always the same. Here we start with a deficit of 4. This is more like Italy, deficit of 1. Like a smaller. This is the one with which they start. Because of persistency, this matters. And then the way you read this table is the following. Here we give you different values of 1 over alpha. So when our alpha is 0, the probability of having 0 hyperinflation is 100%. With rational expectations, you don't have this. And then what I'll give you is the probability to have one, two, three, or more. So with one over alphas of 0.05, the probability of getting more than, they're getting at least one hyperinflation is one minus 15%. And here we are running, we are, we are imposing the exchange rate rule when the expectations go to 150%. Uh, and when we put the crawling peg, we just, put inflation low immediately. We're going to try also lowering inflation slowly, like doing some gradual policy. Uh, gradual policy is going to be bad here. OK, so essentially the point is that these numbers are sizable. So I'm basically going to stick to 0, 0 0.01. So this is like rational expectations. That's what here. And then we're going to think of 0.05. Like we have 95% uh, uh, confidence in your prior for which you can get many, many, many hyperinflations. And here we're just lowering the deficit, the initial deficit a little bit. Of course, the probabilities go down a little bit because you start from, you start with the two points being farther apart in the beginning. So this is a time series simulation of one of those. 
comparing 1 over alpha is called 0 0.05 with 1 over alpha 0 0.0. So when I said inflation can be much higher, that's the difference between the blue and the red. And this is like 700%, which are numbers we've seen. These are not like never happened before. So if you just think that your rational expectations is the right approximation, you're going to get inflation, of course, but you get only the red. If you deviate a little bit, you might get the blue. So that's the first part. But yeah. I don't understand this. You can have a rational expectation in which 1 over alpha is not 0. No, no. No, rational expectations is 1 over alpha equal to 0. Yeah. But because the two distribution doesn't have any, so it's, it's a permanent. Yep. Problem. But you could have, uh, instead, of a two process that has a temporary. Yeah, problem. you could have other processes. And, and, yeah. and, and you could not get these spikes in a rational expectation that has a temporary component in the deficit process? No, because it's always bounded by the high point in the, in the Laffer curve. All my hyperinflations are going up the roof beyond that point. Rational expectations don't go there. Okay, so where the mistake is important is that the, to pass the trend. Yeah, exactly. Is that, is that a small doubt on your prior allows for these dynamics that, uh, because it, exactly, and what's going on is what Mark was asking. If you were had rational expectations, you can never go there. You could never expect, so no, if inflation is high, it has to be some shock but you could never expect you would go beyond. So it's really the fact that you're believe, you think there is a temporary, a permanent change in inflation that makes you update a little bit expectations and you go up the roof. So now I'm going to do some policy analysis. I'm going to tell you, well, first, computations, and that'll be done. So how does the model work? In the model, uh, the gains of a monetary system are bounded and are limited. Because outer key is you eat one when you're young and you eat E when you're old, which is lower than one. And these numbers are calibrated given the money demand I have. Remember, the two parameters of the money demand were one-to-one -one mapping from the parameters of the preferences and the, con and the endowment. So given my calibration, I can compute this. Now, given the calibration, the gains of the monetary system are at most 10% of GDP. So losing money in the economy costs 10% of consumption. I think that number is low, but that's just my opinion. Uh, so I'm just going to also recalibrate the, a, the E that I'm going to be missing on the money demand just to make the gains of, of the monetary system larger. They're going to be 30%. I'm going to show you the two things. Now, what am I also going to do? Once the, I ask uh, the, for the support of the IMF and then I, I put a, an exchange rate rule, I'm going to have a crawling peg. I want to make sure that I get back the system into the stable region, so I'm going to put a crawling peg at the average of these two possible inflations. So I want to make sure that the economy goes back to the region. And then, then I'm also going to uh, allow for a number of periods in, in which I get to this crawling peg. So I could start with a high devaluation and then bring it down, or I can go immediately to bring a, a, low, a low devaluation rate. And then this exchange rate rule is imposed after a certain threshold which you can also think of it as a policy parameter. So I'm starting with, you go immediately to the crawling peg, which is just this average, and you start the exchange rate rules as soon as beliefs are above 150%. Okay, so these are the cost of these hyperinflations relative to the rational expectations. So uh, for the model that we calibrated, in which the gains of monetary system are 10%, what you get is that it's basically 0.4% of lifetime consumption. If I concentrate it on the 10 quarters leading to the hyperinflation, that's about 1.85 of consumption. In an economy that in the which the gains of the monetary, the monetary system are three times that, the consumption cost is more or less double that. Why, why I, I kind of like this picture? Because this is almost like 3% of quarterly consumption during 10 quarters, so that's about 7% of a year consumption. I want to compare this with how many reserves you need in order to stop this crap, okay? Now, another thing you can do is play around with how fast do you stop, when do you stop the hyperinflation? Uh, here I'm stopping them when they are get really high. And what happens if you intervene early? As soon as inflation goes up, then you intervene with the exchange rate. And then of course, then the cost of these hyperinflations are much smaller. So the gains of intervening early are sizable in terms of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, 
of, of welfare costs. What happens if you allow for, gradual, for some gradual adjustment of inflation rates? Uh, then the welfare, maybe the welfare gains of eliminating the hyperinflation are much higher. So waiting is very expensive. Of course, waiting might be required less reserves. So there might be a trade-off there. Well, actually, there isn't. So what I'm showing you now here is, as a function of the, para the policy parameters, whether you wait until it's high, the inflation, or you act early, what I'm showing you is periods after the intervention, and then I'm showing you for different values of capital T. So this is when I intervene immediately. This is when I do gradually in two periods. This is when I do it in three periods. This is when I do it with four. And what every uh, number here tells you is the, the, the balance as a percentage of GDP, of one year GDP, uh, in the account with the IMF. So essentially, this minus 2.3 means that if you're going to stop inflation after they get to 150%, and you do it immediately, you need 2.3% of GDP in the first quarter. But by the second quarter, you can give it back. So these are really like short-term needs that you need. On the other hand, if you compare intervening with 150 or intervening early, you don't need much more than before. Uh, so there seems to be a clear gain by, if you have this option, intervene early. And on the other hand, making different values for T, at the end of the day, sometimes you end up with uh, even a sharp, I mean, like a, a positive amount, uh, but it's not really monotonic. It can be larger for th three periods, but then goes back to, to only 1.4. So the message here is that you only get negative numbers uh, at the beginning, what is this true is that if you take longer, how much you need in the first quarter is lower. So if you really, can, if you don't really don't have much, if you don't have enough, then you, will, you may have to go gradual. But going gradual has substantial welfare costs. So essentially, uh, in here, the exchange rate policies are very important. Uh, early intervention is good, uh, and gradualism, is bad, but it requires less financial assisting in, assistance in the beginning. In all the cases, financial assistance is really short run. These are quarters. OK, uh, testing the belief system. I have a few minutes. So inflation beliefs are not the equilibrium distribution. What can you tell us about modern monetary theory? Uh, during the break. Okay. Uh, it's the same. Print money, this can happen to you. So the question is whether agents can detect this in finite samples. So there are two observables here, inflation and the deficit. So we just put in the vector x the information on observables. Uh, and this is what, I, what, what agents see. And they can test the statistical properties. So we have a nice proposition in the paper, which I'm not going to go in detail, but essentially says that given the law of motion for the deficit, there is a belief system exactly like the ones uh, described above, which are consistent with the first and second moments of x. Uh, if and only if these three tests hold. So it means that if there's a belief system, this test should hold. And if these tests hold, then you can construct belief systems that are like the ones the agents have. OK, and these are the rejection frequencies. This is the last table I'm going to show you. And I see you can barely see it, because I can barely see it. So here, what you have to see whether these numbers are larger than 10%. This is with alpha, and this is a nice property of the model with the hyperinflations themselves. So it kind of confirm the belief system. So this is when our alpha is equal to 0.01. So this, you had a few hyperinflations, but not that many. This is really close. It's not exactly rational expectations, but it's really close. And here you would just reject the model in, 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 in 40 periods. So these rejection frequencies are clearly about 10%. So this is how many times we run this many times, and we check how many times you would reject the, the test. Uh, so the, the point is whether these things are higher or lower than 10%. And here you get clearly about 10%. So here, really, the, 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 the hyperinflation, this recurrence of hyperinflation gives persistence. That makes the agents believe that persistence is there in the data. So when you have the 1 over alpha equal 0.05, uh, in both cases, the long-run deficit is equal to 0, then you get numbers which are in this case, barely above 10%. And this is for like 40 periods, this is for 100. So this is like 10 years, that's like uh, 
25. So this is what we mean by the agents would not necessarily reject their beliefs. Now, of course, these are not unique. There may be others, and uh, the numbers might be different with others. So essentially, we're sort of looking in a set, not, and this is, belongs to that set. That's the only thing we can say. Okay, do not leave the euro with large and persistent deficits. If you do negotiate the exit with the IMF, so what to have financial assistance. Early interventions and fast interventions are better. They're not necessarily more expensive fiscally, except that fast interventions require a little bit more in the beginning, but that you can give it back within a year. And you cannot avoid austerity eventually. If you're going to get off this vicious cycle, you have to adjust the, the, the deficit. I will believe this is a cool example of how you do policy analysis with, in the wilderness. 